Hey y'all, it's Kay from The Literary Apothecary and welcome back to my channel. Hey y'all, it's me again, now back with another Wheel of Time reading vlog. This time for Lord of Chaos, book six. Um, as you can tell, I have the big paperback version this time. I had to go to Barnes & Noble to get this because I didn't own this yet and the library said it would take like nine weeks to get it. So I went, I had a gift card already for Barnes & Noble, so I went and picked this up. This was the only kind that they had there at my Barnes & Noble, so I'm going with it. It'll match, I think, the Dragon Reborn I have in this edition too. Um, I am super excited to see where this story is going to go. I already know about the prologue. I know it's super long and ridiculous. And that's normal for this series, so it'll take me a couple days probably to get through it, but I'm ready to jump in. Um, As always, we have a map at the beginning. Um, does it change though? I don't know. Is it the same map always? I don't remember. Someone there can tell me if it's the same map as it always is or if it's different, if it changes slightly. Um, so before I get back into the actual reading, I just wanted to show, we have this much more detailed map in the middle. It's not in color like the other one was, but it looks like it has maybe some more detail in it. This is the one that looks more familiar to me. Um, there's places that I recognize, Ilian and Emmons Field, of course, um, Tarbon. Andor, I think this is the one that I show off every day and if every time and I feel like it I forget that it's the same. So, you know, I just have to show off these maps. So I'm through the first like fifteen pages so far. You know, still in that prologue. So we start off with one of the Forsaken talking to the Dark Lord. Um, and they're talking about all the events that have just happened. Um, they're mentioning about, um, Revian being killed and Lanford disappearing, Asmodian turning coat, essentially. And we, so we've got that going on. And then we jumped over to Nanive and Suwan and Leanne and Elaine. They're trying to figure out what to do. Elaine wants to go back to where her mother is her family is, um, and Camelin, they won't let her. Of course, I said I won't let her. Uh, Suwan says this is because they don't want her to be in the hands of Rand, the dragon reborn, because then he would have Camelin in addition to everything else, and he's growing p too fat, powerful too fast. We've also got Mogi, Mogarin there, um, in the last book, Nanive collared her, essentially. This book doesn't say specifically if she's still collared, because that was in a dream world. Um, but she's there, and she's very submissive to Nanive. Um, she tries to refuse to tell him information, but in the end, she still does. So Nanive is trying to make sense of all of that now, too. Um, she's starting to reveal information about what all the other... Forsaken our planning and everything. So, oh, I am getting very tired. It's way past my bedtime, and that's going to be it for now. I'll check in again soon. So, further into the prologue now, um, we've got, we've learned that Elaine can make a Tiangriol, and she can invert the weave, so that way whoever is wearing the Tiangriol turns essentially invisible. Took her several tries to do this and she's only got it done once, but she can still do that. Not impress as some of the eyes that I there. We've also learned that Nynaeve has an eavesdropping trick. Um, we don't, don't really know what it is yet, but one of the eyes that I mentioned this to, um, Elaine while they were talking about her little Tiangral trick. And so I am interested to learn more about these things. I'm starting to wonder, and maybe this was discussed before and I just missed it, um, do each Aes Sedai have their own little, quote, trick or 
like special thing that they do or is this even more special that Elaine and Nanive are doing it someone out there can let me know um yeah so Min is going to be going off to Camelin to essentially spy on Rand for um Suan and of course Elaine is sad that she doesn't get to go for more than one reason um and of course Elaine and Min make another friendship pact that they won't let Rand and Min's vision get in between them um so that's where I'm at now and I'll check in again soon Another part of the prologue done, this time we were back in Two Rivers with Fayil and Perrin. Um, the Two Rivers folks have kind of elected Perrin as Lord, Lord of Two Rivers, and Fayil is Lady, and she's been basically running court for him. Um, and then at the very end of the third part of the prologue, he says that he can feel Rand pulling for him, that Rand needs him. And he has to leave to go to him and wants Fayil to stay behind. Fayil says, whatever is best. And then in the text, basically in her thoughts is, well, now I got to make him see what's best. So um, I loved being back with them. Um, my love for Fayil continues to grow. Um, uh, I'm interested to see what's going to happen with their story now. Will she stay behind? Or will she go with Perrin? Or more likely, she'll pretend to stay behind and then follow Perrin. So another part of the prologue has us with Gawain, who's now essentially leading the charge against the Aiel. And he gets word that Queen Morghese and maybe Elaine are dead. He's beside himself in the very last sentence in his section of the prologue is... If they were both dead, he would see whether the dragon reborn could live with a sword through his heart. So this is set up another kind of enemy for Rand now. Even though he doesn't even know if it's true or what's going on, he swore his life for Le Elaine's. And now Elaine might be dead is what he's thinking and he's just in grief already. So... I think we've got like maybe 15 pages left in the prologue. My goal for this weekend is mostly just get through the prologue um, as far as reading in The Lord of Chaos because this thing is long. Um, so, you know, I'll check in again soon. So we're nearly through the prologue. I've got like 10 more pages left in just the prologue. Um, so... That will definitely be finished by the end of this weekend, but not tonight. Um, in this last part that I read, we're with uh, Margace now. She is in Amadicia searching for help, trying to get help from Elrond. And she... Um, Pedro Nile has caught up with her. He in the White Cloaks. He proposes a deal that he will give her as many white cloaks, I think, a ton of white cloaks to take back Camelin. Um, there have been rumors going around that um, Gabriel is dead because the Rand killed Gabriel, and now Rand has the throne in Camelin. Um, I don't think she believes these fully, but she does give them thought because... Those are big rumors. Um, and then a servant boy shows up saying he's from, originally from Camelin. He's staying with his uncle and they'll help him, her escape too. Um, so now she's got two options on how to escape, but she still, besides the white cloaks, which she really doesn't want to give in to, she still doesn't have help back at Camelin. So it was good to be back with Margase again. She's one of my favorites and... It's good to be back there, and I love seeing all of these different rumors and the different actions going on in this book from the ending of the last book, Fires of Heaven, and all of these different points of views. It makes the world feel so much smaller and bigger at the same time, and, you know, you just get that gossipy feel, and it just is nice seeing things from different points of view that are the same thing. 
Um, so that's it for now, and I'll check in again soon. So up next in the everlasting prologue of Lord of Chaos, we've met some more of the Forsaken. We met three new ones, and we've seen Demandred again. And they're all speculating what's going to happen, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and Demandred has revealed what the Dark Lord has told him to these other three. Um, and the first part that I don't think we heard um, at the very beginning of this prologue was, and this is where it ties into the chap, the name of the book, he said, Let the Lord of Chaos Rule. I don't know about you guys, but for me, I love it when the, you spot the title of a book inside the book, in the context of the book. I absolutely eat that up every single time I look for it, and it makes the reading experience so much better. So that's where that came in. I'm hoping it comes back again later, because um, I've got the you know trade paperbacks, um, and we're only at page 76, so I'm really hoping that it comes up again. I've only got a couple more pages left in the prologue, which I'll finish later today, and then I'll check in again after I finish the prologue. So I've reached the end of the prologue in Lord of Chaos, and in this last bit, we see two more of the Chosen essentially come to life, and this is the first time that we actually see it happening. They're actually put into someone else's body, and given new names and their powers, they cannot access the one true power yet They're, that's been taken away. And they said, the Murdoch said that once the Great Lord determines they will, they're able to use it again, they'll be able to use it. But until then, they haven't been severed, but they're essentially blocked from using it. So this was an interesting end to the chapter. Like I've said before, I am interested to see where chapter one picks up. Um, is this going to be one of those prologues that's great content, but not really a prologue? Or are we going to skip ahead or back? And I don't know. I'm interested to see what's going to happen in chapter one. Through two chapters now of the Lord of Chaos and... So far, this is kind of boring. I was a little bit falling asleep, but that's also because I'm tired too. Um, so, a couple thoughts. Um, the main text of this book, outside of the prologue, opens with two chapters on Rand, which is probably why I was a little bit bored, because he's not my favorite character. And things are either really 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 exciting when he's around or not exciting um so seems like this takes up just where the prologue is which to me is not the purpose of a prologue i feel like robert jordan did not use this prologue very well um but that's just my two cents y'all know how i feel about prologues anyways um but i like I said before, I did really like the content in the prologue. It just didn't feel like a prologue to me. Now, chapters one and two, like I said, were with Rand. And he's training his army, building his army up. Um, he is with the Aiel and he's with Fael's family and people. Um, he's in, I think he's in Camelin. Um and so Lord Bashir, who's Fayil's dad, is kind of like his right hand man right now. Um and then in chapter two we get a new person that has arrived. Um his name is Tame and he was one of the false dragons, but he can also channel supposedly and Rand has some plan for him that we don't know. I don't really trust this guy yet. Could be just because he's new. And a lot of times when someone new totally random shows up, it's one of the Forsaken. Um, could be that Rand doesn't trust him. So therefore that is passed down to me as the reader because Rand is our main point of view right now. 
Um, and also, he's done stuff to Bashir's people that is not fantastic. So, I'm waiting to see just where he turns out um, and who he is, really. But that's it for now. This might be the end of the reading vlog. Might have another one, another check in tomorrow. Depends on if I finish my other audiobook or not. Because I probably won't get any actual physical reading done. So if I get anything else done, it'll be on the audiobook. But now I'm rambling, so I'm going to wrap this up. So yeah, I'm going to end this reading vlog here at the end of chapter 2. Um, so far, this is not one of my favorite books. So I did really enjoy that prologue, even though it was super long and not really a prologue in my point of view. But ending this here and moving on next week, starting with chapter 3. Hopefully things get better from here. I am now through chapter four, I think it is. Yep. Four. Um, and, you know, honestly, there's not a lot to report. We're still with Rand. Matt's off trying to fight Samuel. Samuel. Um, but we don't see it. We've been stuck with Rand this whole time. And he's trying to build his army of men that can channel the source um to fight the Aes Sedai and the Unforsaken as far as I understand it um yeah I mean that's pretty much what's happened the only thing that um I'm slightly confused on and it's not a huge deal is how old these kids are now um Robert Jordan doesn't do a very good job job of distinguishing time and so i'm kind of wondering to me rand is still that somewhere in his teenage years maybe 16 17 maybe even 18 but in the text it makes him sound like he's a lot older so i'm not sure how old he is at this point um but that's the only thing really that i have to mention right now I'm hoping things kind of pick up as we go. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm told by someone who will go unnamed at the moment that this is one of the most boring books of the whole series. So I don't have a lot of hope, although I do hope that it picks up so I don't have to rate it very low. Um, but we'll see. Um... If we can change some points of views, I'm used to, you know, every chapter being a different point of view. And so far, we've just had Rand, who is not the most exciting point of view at all. Um, I'm hoping since, especially since in the prologue, we got all of those different points of views that we'll at least get a few in this book. But, of course, we'll see. Um, so that's it for now. So, at least in Chapter 5, we get a different point of view. We're back with Matt now, or Lord Cothran, as the his band likes to call him. Um, not much is going on. He's on his way to essentially fight Samuel um, with a whole band of people, obviously. And the, the funny thing about Matt, first of all, he's still hilarious. I still love him. He's less funny right now than he used to be um but one of the things that he does because of what was prophesized in the Tangriel to him every time he meets a woman that he begins to either get along with or start to like or you know whatever um he asks them about the daughters of the nine moons does this mean anything to you and if they don't know what he's talking about which no one does um then he's able to enjoy himself because if you remember from a previous book, it was prophesied in the town real that he's going to marry the daughter of the nine moons one day. And he's not ready to do that. He still wants to be a ladies man. And he is um, almost terrified that he'll actually find this daughter of nine moons. So we see him ask this over and over again in these books and, it's just Matt's way of kind of taking stock of where he's at in the future. And that um, the other thing that we see happen 
is Rand traveling by the ways. He comes to Matt's room, you know, tells Matt essentially, you got to hurry up and slow down. Slow down to hurry up. Um, this is how you take on Samuel. Matt says, yeah, I know this was the plan. I was part of the plan making. And then Rand kind of goes into a little bit of his craziness, asks how you know if you're in love, um, goes into further craziness, and Matt kind of writes him off, and then Rand goes back to um, Camelin Carrion. Um, so it's kind of where we're at now. Um, I'm glad to be back with Matt, but it feels like a different kind of Matt now. Maybe Matt's starting to grow up, or maybe it's just the mood of the book or what he's about to do. Um, but I'm definitely glad to have a different point of view other than Rand. So, yep. So in chapter six, this is a, an important chapter because we get the point of view from three of the chosen, three different chosen. First, we're with Samuel. Um, and he is with, so Semiel is with Grandal and, um, they're talking about Rand, of course, everyone's talking about Rand, um, and we, we don't, we don't learn a lot through this point of view, although I like seeing these points of views, we learn more from the other two points of views. I felt like this part, the Semiel's point of view was mostly a setup for the second point of view that we get in this chapter, Grendel, who was talking to Samuel in the first part. Um, through her, we learn a lot. We learn that she and the other um, Forsaken, the other Chosen, are basically setting up Samuel to be killed by Randall Thor, although they don't know that Rand has sinned matt instead of himself to fight samuel um we've also learned that um messena is in the white tower with the Aes Sedai. so there is a chosen implanted in the white tower with the Aes Sedai. so that is also very important um then we get our third point of view from Semiraj, and I'm trying to keep these all straight because they're all in the same chapter, um, who is another female chosen, and she is on, she has been tasked with torturing an Aes Sedai to get as much information as she can from them, and then to drain them of their power. So she's got this Aes Sedai that she's torturing, um, and... Um, basically we, we see this, um, going back to Grendel, I think it was, she believes that she is going to be the, um, Nablus, which is basically the most obedient, the best, um, of the great Lord's servants. So she believes that. Um, Semiraj is on this torture trick. None of them really believe that Lanfear is dead, which is important because at the end of the last book, we were told that Lanfear and, um, Morg Moraine were dead. So that is, I feel like, an important bit. They don't know what's happened to Asmodian yet. Um, but they believe that both of them are still alive. Um, and we also see that, so we also see that Semiraj had sent the Murdra and the Trollocs to the Stone of Tear to fight Samuel, not to help him, but to fight him. So that's an important kind of turn in this um all of the chosen all the forsaken are out for themselves only and they are essentially battling each other and so that is something that's important to see not only to be told but to see here 
So that's the end of that chapter. Um, probably all I'm going to get through today. So I'll check in again soon. So chapter 10, we're with Rand again. He's in Camelot. He comes across an uh, inn and a in slash tavern, I think it is. And some important things happen in this chapter. First of all, he finds a whole bunch of girls from two rivers there. They say that they've been tested to for the power to channel and they've passed and they're on their way to Tarvalin to become Aes Sedai. Um, Lorraine and Alana are with them that two Aes Sedai are with them and while Rand first Rand thinks he needs Elaine to um gain Andor peacefully and that's all he wants Elaine for now and then he keeps remembering the last words that Moraine said to him before she died trust no woman with the shawl he goes and speaks to Lorraine and Alana alone and Alana says she will not hurt him. She touches his head and bonds him, which was what Elaine's um, plan was all along. And he just lets her do this. Like, he doesn't know that she's bonding, but he just lets her touch him while he's thinking of Moraine's words not to trust a woman with a shawl. So this is a little, like, what the heck was Rand thinking in this moment? And then he gets mad when they say, oh, she just bonded you. She didn't hurt you. She didn't break her word. Like, he just let her go and do this. He should, as the dragon ray born, he's very, very, very naive. And he doesn't trust people, but he does at the same time. I don't know if they, like, had control over him before this happened or what. But this chapter was a little jarring in that. Like, he says he doesn't trust anyone, but he just let them go and do this. So, I don't know. There's thoughts that I can't quite get my words wrapped around yet. So, first correction. Um, Varen is the other Aes Sedai there with Alana. Um, the name that I mentioned before, Lauren? Laren? Um, she's one of the... Uh, girls from Two Rivers. That's why that name stood out to me. Um, another note about the girls from Two Rivers that I forgot to mention that seems pretty darn important. First of all, there are so many of them. They, the Aes Sedai say that Two Rivers is like a gold trove. But also, one of the girls is Matt's sister. So that's like, Matt can do his thing. And now his sister. And so... There's something going on with Two Rivers that is going to come up later, I'm sure. In Chapter 12, there's um, a few things that we learn. So, um, we learn that Alana bonding with Rand without his permission is something that I said I do not do. They said this hasn't been done in like hundreds of years. So this is, not only is it important because Rand is a dragon reborn and it's now bonded to Alana, so we don't know the implications of that or the implications that would happen um, with Elaine, but also the fact that she did this without his permission and it's the first time in hundreds of years is huge. Um... We also follow, um, Rand goes to, um, Taim and the men that he's training to channel and basically, you know, they're building their own army, which we knew before, but this kind of conversations with Taim kind of reinforces that. And so, um... These two juxtapositions now are going to be important going forward. Rand is building his army of men who can channel. And, you know, the tower is trying to build their, essentially, 
Aes Sedai army. And so this is going to be important going forward, I think. So I'm up through chapter 23 now. I am making really good progress on this book this month. Um, I think because I'm less focused on trying to find things to talk about for our live show since we're postponing our live shows for a while now, but continuing the read along, of course. Um, I don't know. I'm just making much faster progress than normal. So this, I think it's maybe about halfway in the book already, and it's the 14th, 15th, so that's exciting. Um, so I'm going to try to remember everything that I haven't checked in about so far that I feel like need to check in on, but I'm sure I've missed stuff because I haven't checked in in a long time on this book and, um, not a lot has happened, but some stuff has happened. So let's see, we've got Egwene now and she had a dream. Essentially, she was walking in a dream. Um, wasn't her dream though, it was, um, Gawain's dream, and he was coming to rescue Egwene, who was basically tied up, kept captive, prisoner by Rand. So she's trying to figure out what that all means. Um, Elaine and Nanive are planning their own secret trip to try to find a what they think is a Tiongreal that they found while they were dreamwalking, but they can't bring it back with them, so they have to go to the place where they were at um, to get it and bring it back. Matt is off on his journey. There's still kind of a... Um, Elida has put out a almost an arrest warrant for to bring back Elaine and Nanive. Um, they're still trying to learn everything they can. Rand has run into Loyal's mother, who also has another Ogier with her, who is the o female Ogier that the mother wants Loyal to marry. Which was Loyal's worry was about all this time, if he went back, his mother would want him to marry another Ogier and he wouldn't be able to travel the world like he wanted to. So Rand has found them and he's led them back to two rivers except Rand didn't actually go to two rivers. So Loyal's mom and fiance to be are on their way to two rivers where Rand says you'll be able to find Loyal. Um, I think yeah I think that's about all I've got to check in on. Um, we've still got shenanigans and mistrustings of the, um, Forsaken. So, we've still got this mistrusting of the, um, Forsaken. No one trusts any of the others. And so we get another chapter with Grendel and, Grendel and Samael. And Samael basically tells Grendel that she needs to bring him proof that these other Forsaken are dead. Um, he doesn't know, they don't know what happened to Demandred or Semeraj or Messina or um, the one that Nanif has. I'm sorry, my brain is blanking again. Um, Moigden. So Samia basically says, like, I'm going to become the Nablus and... I'm going to defeat the Dragon Reborn. In order for you to be by my side during this, you need to bring me proof that these other Forsaken are dead. Um, he doesn't trust that they're dead. He doesn't know what happened to them, but he doesn't believe that they're dead. So that's basically what's been happening. Um, it's not been a very exciting book for me, but um, I do love seeing all of the world building that Robert Jordan has been doing. So there's... That's been a plus in this book. A quick note on what you're about to see because what happened was last night when I was um, starting to put all of this together to put it up on Patreon, I accidentally erased a couple of my 
early check-ins for this week from chapters 27 to 41. So this first clip is me going to trying to summarize my thoughts from those chapters. Um, however, there is one bit that you'll see in this next clip after this that is part of those chapters so I took that out of my reactions in this clip but you'll see how it's gonna be a little bit of a mess but we'll make it through so chapters 27 to 41 um, this is kind of where we get some stuff actually happening in this book Egwene learns that the White Tower Embassy is looking for a rogue Aes Sedai she's been meeting with Gawain secretly and he tells her of this news they think that rogue Aes Sedai is her. She goes to see Rand and tell, to tell him about this. However, the embassy arrives at the palace where they're at. And so Rand uses the one power to make Egwene invisible, um, which is incredible. I was completely blown away by that power. Um, Meanwhile, Nanive can use weaving to heal stilling. She discovered this accidentally um, with Loghain, and so now she's healed Loghain, Suan, and Leanne. Leanne has chosen to switch from Blue Aja to Green Aja now. Um, I guess since they're kind of reborn as Aes Sedai, they can do that, because um, technically they weren't Aes Sedai when they were stilled. Um, so then Rand sends Matt to escort Elaine from Saladar to Camelin to claim her throne. Um, and this interaction is absolutely hilarious. Um, Egwene can travel in the dream world in the flesh instead of just as like a shadow kind of. She can actually be there in the dream world. So she uses her powers there to create essentially a dream Bella who we haven't seen for books um, to essentially travel to Saladar. Um, once they're in Saladar, this is part of what I had already added in my reactions in the next clip, but I just add in a note here that, um, and then last but not least, we get this interaction between Avienda and Elaine, and they essentially agree to share Rand with Min. So the three of them are just going to share Rand, and that's going to turn out to be really interesting. Um, so now going forward, you'll have my reactions as normal as I come across them in the book. So sorry about this little mix up, but we're making do with what we can. So I have finished up through chapter 42 now, making such great progress. I think I'll be able to finish it this week if everything goes to plan, which is fantastic, a week in advance. Um, so yes, uh, lots to report. Well, not lots, but some to report back. Um, I don't know if I checked in uh, where I last checked in. But the um, Aes Sedai have gone through with making Egwene the Amarlin seat. They did their votes, everyone. Um, they had a unanimous consensus. And now Egwene is the Amarlin seat in Saldea. Um So we have two Amarlin seats now. And she has made, I think I did check in about this, so I'll erase this if I did. Um, she has made Elaine and Nanive, and I think some of the Aiel, up to full Aes Sedai now. And then we get Matt in Saldea with um, Egwene and Elaine and Nanive, and this bit was hilarious. Matt is trying to put them in their place and they keep saying Matt Egwene is the Aes Sedai, you need to respect her, blah 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 blah. And Matt's like, no. I grew up with her as kids. 
is not going to happen. Um, and then we get Min, who has traveled with some of these Aes Sedai. Um, and she goes to Rand and Chiron. And um, they send her in first to kind of smooth the way. There's 11 Aes Sedai, which is a dangerous number and she tells him all that she knows and except for this vision of the three women that she's had um he talks about Avienda and Elaine and how he's confused and maybe thinks he loves them both he says he slips up and says that first he says he thinks he doesn't think of Min as a woman and she catches him on it instantly and then he has to backtrack his words and I'm like girl I've been there I've had boys say that to me before and it's hurtful um but he backtracked and made smooth over um and then Min tells him that she has seen a vision of him there's an aura around him that some Aes Sedai are going to hurt him she doesn't know which Aes Sedai. She doesn't even know if it's Aes Sedai that she has traveled with. But all she knows is that Aes Sedai are going to hurt him. Um, and then in the next chapter, Rand goes to the, quote, farm, now labeled the Black Tower to balance off the White Tower, where all of his soldiers are essentially being trained. And he's created, essentially, a training process, levels, just like the ice that I have, but have, you know, he's got um, different names for them. There's soldiers at the lowest level, and then they become dedicated, which are like the ice that I accepted, um, and they get a sword, little sword medal. And then after that, they become, um, I forget the name, the Ashaman. Um, which means essentially guardian in the old tongue. And they get another gold medal, essentially, when they become Ashram. He has, in front of all the soldiers, he has essentially raised Taim to the Ashaman level. And Taim, Taim doesn't react well to this. Um, when they're alone, he expresses concern about their being 11 Aes Sedai there. He does not trust them at all. Um, Louis Theron, again, does not trust Taimon and wants to kill him. Taim raises the fact that there are scores of red Aes Sedai out in the countryside that he doesn't trust. Um, Louis Theron believes that these Aes Sedai were working with Taim, and Rand suppresses Louis Theron, and that's basically where we're at now the very end of chapter 42 rand says that he is going to teach these 11 Aes Sedai a lessons and have them basically begging to him and bowing to him at the end so um some important things have happened in these last couple chapters and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens going forward one thing i have noticed is that we don't get a, since it's happened we don't get a lot of talk about the bonding of alana and Rand, which seems like an important point. Here and there, it's mentioned kind of an offhand. I know it's going to come up at some point because Robert Jordan doesn't let those things just slide by, but so far, it hasn't been a big deal at all. Um, so, yep, yeah, that's it for now. So, up through chapter 46 now, coming close to the end, just a couple hours left in the audiobook. Um, where I'm at now... We've got a couple things happening. So Perrin has made it to Camelin and has talked to Rand, explained what's happened in Two Rivers. Um, Min says, tells Rand after Perrin has left the room that she had a vision with Perrin and Rand in it. She says that Without Perrin there, Rand will be hurt twice. But her vision cannot tell her that if keeping him by his side will prevent it from happening. So anytime Min has a vision is really important. So 
one of the reasons why I love her so much. Um, while in Caitlin, Parent does the husband duty and meets Fayil's mother and father, Bashir. And things get really heated really quickly. Um, but in the end, uh, Fayil's mother says that she expects at least six kids from them. And her father has approved of Perrin as a husband. Um, and so that was kind of a nice touch to everything that's going on here because that's kind of a little bit of normalcy in this. Um, yeah, that's basically where I'm at now and I hope to finish really soon. Through chapter 53 now and I know I've missed something somewhere along the way because I think I tuned out at one point. Nothing was really happening. Um, Elaine and Nanive made it to Abu Dhar and met with the queen and I kind of tuned out. And then all of a sudden I started paying attention again today on my way home from work. And all of a sudden it's talking about Rand being captured by the Aes Sedai and on their way to Tarvalan and wanting to torture Min in front of Rand and I don't know how he got captured um but you know what I'm just gonna go with it and continue on instead of having to go back and reread the chapter because I don't got time for that really um so yeah I just had to check in and say like I know something happened that I missed but you know what I'm just going with it I'm just moving on with it and I'm going to finish up these last couple chapters here. I probably won't check in until I'm done. Um, but yeah, I am going to push through and finish this off. So, so I finished Lord of Chaos and I'm going to try to wrap up my thoughts about this ending here. I'm sure that I've, I'll miss some things in this and I apologize if I've missed your favorite part or your favorite character, but I'm trying my best and also trying to enjoy it as best as I can. So in the last couple chapters, We've got Ran is, you know, captured by the Aes Sedai. He's in this box chest thing, held by the power. Um, Perrin is leading two river folk and also some Aiel and the wise ones, along with Aes Sedai, to go and rescue Rand from the other Aes Sedai that are, have him captured and were taking him to the tower. Um, there's, you know, another giant battle. Gowan is there with his guys, his men, and he has promised Egwene that he wouldn't kill Rand. He wouldn't touch Rand, but he says he's also not going to lend a hand to help him either. So he's there kind of just watching this whole all happen. Um, Rand uses the power to essentially break the bonds that are holding him in this chest. Escape. Perrin meets up with him. Min meets up with him. They're all glad that he's still alive. Um, Loyal's there, of course. He's still alive. Um, they've got, you know, the Aes Sedai kind of under control. Um, and then the other Aes Sedai, including Alana come up to Rand and say, come with us, we can help you. And Rand has finally learned the lesson that Moraine was trying to teach him all along, not to trust an Aes Sedai even a little bit. And he says, no, y'all are just like them. Y'all are all, all Aes Sedai. And you must kneel to me. Um, and then we ha get this, like, last line in the chap the last chapter before the um, epilogue. The last couple lines, I'll read. On a day of fire and blood, a tattered banner waved above Dumai's wells, bearing the ancient symbol of Aes Sedai. On a day of fire and blood, and the one power... As prophecy had suggested, the unstained tower, broken, 
bent knee to the forgotten sign. The first nine Aes Sedai swore fealty to the dragon reborn, and the world has changed forever. That's the first time I got goosebumps because of just a single line. That last line, especially the world has changed forever, that gave me complete goosebumps. And that's the first time in Lord of Chaos that I've actually written down a quote. So after that last chapter, we get this epilogue, which is kind of reminds me of like a movie at the very end of a movie where they're kind of showing different points of views and different people crazy things happening leading into kind of the sequel to follow it um and i don't know that i can comment on all of this is happening because my mind is still processing i literally just finished this all but what i have found is herod has been killed by a golem which is in the wheel of time Thanks to my Wheel of Time companion book, I've learned they're kind of like part a uh, part of the Shadow Spawn, and they can literally rip a man into pieces, which is what they did to Herod. Um, and they can form the. There's only six made, I think, by Demandred, and they can form either the presence, the image of a man or a woman. I think. Three are in the image of a man and three are in the image of a woman. And so Herod is no longer. Um, there is a writer at Abu Dhar, unnamed. I don't know if this is supposed to be Matt or not. But they do mention perhaps that fellow's comment had been an omen. Perhaps the return would come soon. And the daughter of the nine moons with it, surely that would be the greatest omen of victory. Now, we know that Matt went with Egwene, um, Elaine and Aniv to Abu Dhar. We know that they've made it there. We know that Matt is supposed to marry one day the daughter of the nine moons. But this paragraph doesn't actually name Matt. So it could be Matt. It could be someone else, I think. And then we circle up with Moigdin, and she is essentially freed and summoned to Shale Ghoul. We don't know what's going to happen when she gets there, if she'll be celebrated, applauded, or punished, but she's on the loose now again. Um, and Egwene is still the Amarlin seat one of the Almerlin seats. Um, and something, I'm not sure what happens here. Um, Egwene looked around. She had felt the necklace come off and the felt the flash of pain that meant a man could channel had brushed the link. Um, but it wasn't the one that freed Moigden. Uh, so that is, I don't know what that, um, she thought maybe could be Loghain. And so she felt the necklace come off and felt the flash of pain that meant a man who could channel had brushed the link. Most people were already asleep, but a few still outside their tents, around the fires, and some not far. It might be possible to find out which man had come to Merrigan's tent. Um... This is, Merrigan has run away, um, but we don't, and I think, I forget who Merrigan was. Um, maybe it was Loghain, maybe not. Uh, and then it ends with Demondred kneeling in front of the Dark One at the Pit of Doom. And the Great Lord slash the Dark One is laughing, and that is, how we end this book so now that i've finished lord of chaos i think i'm gonna give this one three and a half stars um there were some amazing moments that i loved but overall it just felt like mm, not a lot actually happened a lot was planned um and a lot of plans fell through and a lot of new plans were made 
but not a lot really happened in this book. Um, but we did learn a lot, which is why I'll give it three and a half stars and not just three stars. Um, so that wraps up this Wheel of Time reading vlog for The Lord of Chaos. And I will be back with another reading vlog once I start book seven, which I don't know the title off the top of my head. But once we start that, I will mention that title, of course. Um, and as you might be aware, we are putting a hold on our live shows for now, just so we can all regroup after life and stuff. Um, so it might be one month, it might be two months, it might be longer than that. We're not quite sure when, but as you can see, I finished this a lot faster than normal, so way to go on that. Um, as always, you know, let me know in the comments below what you thought of this book, what were your favorite moments, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, thank you all for watching this. I love you to the moon and back. Bye.